10. If we read from Acts 8, and um, I want Acts 8 to kind of function as a justification for what we're going to do, okay? So Acts 8 to begin with then, and it's this account of Philip um, preaching to an Ethiopian. We all know it. So we'll read from verse 26. So Acts 8 and uh, verse 26, and we'll just read down into the chapter. So an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And this is a desert region. So Philip arose and went, and look, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, and a Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. So the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading aloud the prophet Isaiah. And he said to him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. He had reached the place in the scripture which read like this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Now the eunuch turned to Philip and said, Tell me, of whom is the prophet speaking? of himself maybe, or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now the principle that, that we have in this encounter is found in the last phrase of that verse. So if you look at verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, which is from Isaiah 53, he preached Jesus to him. And that principle is whichever scripture you look at and read, two things are required. The first is that we find Jesus Christ. So I've been saying this to you for many years now. Whichever part of the Bible you open, whatever you look, whatever you read, you find Jesus Christ. That's the most obvious and fundamental principle that you see here. But the second one is the fact that the Ethiopian says to Philip, how can I understand unless somebody helps me? And I think it's true to say that our understanding of the Bible is a, a result of a process, a process of interaction, a process of coming together and looking together and talking together about the Bible. So this Ethiopian had been to the great religious festivals at Jerusalem and he came away knowing as little as he had when he went there in the first place. What you need to understand the scripture is this human interaction. So with that in mind then, the fact that every scripture leads us to Jesus and we need to do it together, I want us to start a new theme tonight. And the new theme is this. We've gone through every book of the Bible, haven't we? And we have done so during the lockdown. So 66 books, we took a look at them. Some books we combined. So do you remember Samuel was one and two Samuel? We looked at that in one go. But we've gone all the way through the Bible and I was reflecting on this. And I thought to myself, okay, that's fine. But what we should have done maybe, or what we need to do, is we need to have an overall sense of what the Bible's message is. If you like, what I think we need to do is have a, a general understanding of what its message is. So we may be able to think about the individual books, but unless we've got a sense of what is the Bible's main message, then we are not really doing ourselves a great service. So I want to start tonight thinking with you about what is the Bible's main 
message? What is the great thrust of what God says to us in the Bible? So we're going to look at a big picture, not an individual picture of certain verses or even certain books. Let's have the biggest picture of, 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 of them all. What is the Bible's message? And what I want to do is to think about that big picture by looking at three chapters. And these three chapters can provide us with a very good sense of what the Bible's main message is. If we, if we grasp these three chapters, we'll have a clear idea of what the Bible is speaking to us about. What does God want us to know? Now, the three chapters, you may have heard somebody say this before, the three chapters are Genesis 3, John chapter 3, and Romans chapter 3, okay? Those three chapters, if we can place them side by side and get to grips with their cont content, those three chapters give us a sense of the Bible's message. So that's what we're going to start doing tonight. I don't know how far we'll get, and I don't know how long we'll do it for, but it, it just became clear to me that we need this big, broad, grand sweep of an understanding of what the Bible's message is. We need it for ourselves, but we also need it. Should we then talk to anyone who doesn't know the Bible? Should we have conversations with family and friends who are not Christians? We need to be able to communicate effectively what the great message is of the scriptures. And really that's what Philip was doing with the Ethiopian. So these three chapters then provide us with that great sweep of the Bible's call, the Bible's um, voice to all of us. Genesis 3, John 3, Romans 3. So let's start with Genesis and chapter 3. So turn with me then to this first of these three chapters, and I want us to read from the first verse, and we'll read down into the chapter. Let's see how far we go. So Genesis, first book in the Bible, and chapter 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, of the, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now the serpent turned to the woman and said, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree, that it was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, this is the first chapter to get to grips with if you want a, a sense of what the Bible's message is. So let's explain things. And then we're going to, to kind of summarize. So what we have here is an account of the origins of sin and the bible's great message is a declaration of the sinfulness of humanity human beings are sinful and what you find in genesis 3 is the reason for that the origins of that and if you like let's think of it in these ways you look at Genesis 3 and you're presented with the problem of sin. What is sin? 
What are these consequences? And how does God respond to it? That's what I want us to think about, okay? But the fundamental issue that the Bible tells us is the problem of sin for every human in all human experience. So we have Eve here, the first woman, married to Adam, as we are told in the passage, the first man. And together, Adam and Eve are presented to us as made in the image of God, made for fellowship with God. And when we meet them, or at least we meet Eve in chapter 3, Adam and Eve are, are in fellowship with God. They have a relationship with God. Now, into that perfect picture comes the serpent. We have this conversation between the serpent and Eve. And the result of that conversation is Eve takes an action which renders her and Adam sinful. Now, if you want, we can go into all the details about the serpent and the tree and the fruit and the knowledge. But at this point, let me just say simply that this is an account of the problem of sin and sin is presented to us as a breaking of the relationship between Adam and Eve and God. Sin is the rapture of the fellowship between God, the creator, and man and woman as his creatures. Sin is essentially the rapturing of that relationship. So when I ask you, what is sin? Sin is concerned with the breaking of the relationship between us and God. So it may be easier for me to say that sin isn't about stealing and lying and committing adultery. Sin isn't about taking drugs and getting drunk. Sin is essentially concerned with the breaking of the relationship between humanity and God. So originally, humanity was in fellowship with God, created to know God. Human beings were made like God, to know God, to be with God, to be fulfilled in relationship with God. There was a trust relationship, and that is broken, and that is what sin is. So I, to me, it's very important that we understand what sin is. And I think we get completely confused so often. And part of the problem here is the problem of the church. Speakers, preachers, teachers in the church have made this a problem by talking about certain acts like stealing or drug taking. And so often the church presents that as sin. Well, of course, that's a, a very fundamental mistake. Sin is essentially, here we go, sin is essentially vertical. It's to do with us and God. It's about that relationship, that disconnect, separation between human beings and God. Sin is what human beings have done, which leads to separation from the one God who is the creator of us all, the giver of life, the sustainer of life, the God who, who has given all things. It's that rapture. That's what sin is. And so every human being is sinful because there is no relationship between the, the person and God from the outset of life. And people are sinners because people continue to live without a trust relationship between themselves and God. So every person is a sinner because there is that lack of personal relationship to God. 
No, I've got to be careful here because I'm not saying there's no relationship with God because God is the creator of all. He is the sustainer of all. He gives to all. He provides for all. What is missing, what is lacking because of sin is a lack of a personal trust relationship with God. Instead of trust, what we have and what we see in Genesis 3 is a breaking away from God, a denial of God, a rejection of God, a distrust of God, um, an aversion to God, uh, um, a, a desire to escape God. That is what sin is. Now, I hope you can see this. Because if you say, and I've heard it, we've heard it recently. Do you remember when we had a, somebody come to speak in a, in a weeknight meeting? who told us about people whose lives were ruined by drugs and drink. And if we make that out to be sin, then we make a huge mistake. Sin is essentially concerned with God and our response, our attitude, our fracturing from God. Okay, that's what sin is. Now, let me ask you, what does sin lead to? What are its consequences? And uh, if you just take a look at what we read in Genesis 3 and verse 8, what you have there is a consequence of sin. So what happens from verse um, 6 to and verse 7 is we have the act that is the sinful act. Eve listens to the serpent and eats the fruit. That's the action which results in sin. Verse 8 is the consequence. Take a look at verse 8 again. So Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God in the, among the trees in the garden. The consequence of sin, human beings have an aversion to God. There is in every human being an inbuilt desire to run from, hide from God himself. We'll see when we come to John 3 what John, how John describes it. But instinctive, deep within every human being, is an aversion to God, a desire to hide from God. And what fuels that is guilt. And guilt features very heavily in Genesis chapter 3, the guilt of the human condition. If you like, the Bible's message is clear, human beings it is part of the human experience to know guilt. And it's a guilt before a God whom you will not acknowledge. A guilt that is deep within all of us that leads us to hide from and run from and deny God himself. And that's what you see Adam and Eve doing in verse 8. Now, let me add one thing to that, and that's the idea you see in verse 7 of making coverings for themselves. So guilt is the opposite of innocence. So when we meet Adam and Eve, they are innocent. They have a relationship with God, and a um, evidence of that is innocence. And that's what nakedness symbolizes. It's the lack of guilt, the lack of shame. The, the original condition is one of easiness in the presence of God. That is lost, and Adam and Eve then seek to make themselves coverings. So they take fig leaves, we are told, and they sew them together, and they seek to cover their guilt. Now, that is another um, element of the human condition. Ever since, human beings have sought to cover themselves, to either hide or to 
better present or to make themselves more acceptable or to deal with this spiritual guilt through what they can do before God. Now, I'm introducing the ideas that you have in Genesis 8, and what I'm hoping we'll do then is we'll open them up for discussion. But can you just see the, the, the ideas here, okay? Sin is essentially a, a breaking of this relationship with God, and it results for human beings in two things, guilt and then the desire to hide to hide their bodies, to hide their presence, to hide themselves, to cover up, to put layer upon layer upon layer on top so that what is underneath cannot be seen. This is the human condition. And then the third thing to think about from these verses is how does God respond to sin? So we didn't read it, but from verse 9, you get this detail, and it's a very detailed account of how God responds to sin. And I just want to point out one or two things about the, the response of God to sin. And the very first thing to notice is that Genesis 3 tells us God responds to sin. It's not that God is indifferent. It's not that God, in a sense, doesn't concern himself. God has a very personal and very immediate response to the sin of Adam and Eve. And so we see it from verse 9 right down to verse 19. And it may be, when we get into the structure a bit more, that we'll do more of a kind of um, textual stuff. But right now, I'm just painting in very broad strokes. Look at verse 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now, there are those two ideas again. The nakedness, the guilt, the shame, and then the hiding, Okay. And he said, verse 11, now this is God, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now, first thing to notice, God holds Adam responsible for what he's done. God will hold Eve responsible for what she has done. And God, in turn, will hold the serpent responsible. Now, here's a fundamental element of the message of the Bible. God holds human beings responsible. Now, that's a very strange notion these days, but it's one that we must be very clear about. God holds everyone at every time, from every age, he holds every human being personally accountable to him for their sin. And there is no escape from that personal accountability to God, which is characteristic of every human being. So you and I, when we think of those who are not Christians, families and friends, they are accountable to God, and God will hold them accountable. God will do what you see here in, in Genesis 3. God will interrogate, examine, question, like a, like a, a, a lawyer, like a, a prosecutor. God will do that to every human being. And so if you skip now way into the New Testament, we hear such verses as from Paul, the apostle, knowing the terror of the Lord. We've got that verse, haven't we? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of Almighty God. Now, this is the message of the Bible. Every human being is accountable to God for her sin for his sin, for the failure to have a personal trust relationship with God. God will hold every human being responsible for the guilt 
and the shame and the desire to hide from God and the putting layer upon layer upon layer to cover us so that God doesn't see us, God will hold us responsible, okay? That's the first way in which God responds by holding accountable human action. Now, the second thing that you see from these uh, verses, uh, verses 14 and 15 and 16, you see it, you know, throughout, is you have the idea of wrath. God responds, having held us accountable, God then says, okay, here is my anger. Here is my holy response. And there is wrath as a result. Now, this idea of wrath is introduced in three ways in Genesis 3. There's God's wrath upon the servant. There's God's wrath upon the woman. And there's God's wrath upon the man. And the idea of wrath here is framed in terms of human experience. God's wrath is going to be known in the everyday fabric of human experience. So wrath is a present everyday reality of human life from this moment on. So wrath isn't something that's going to happen in the future. It's not something that's going to happen after death, like heaven and hell. Wrath is part, God's wrath is part of the very fabric of human experience. It is built in to human life, just like oxygen and the atmosphere. God's wrath is part of the tapestry of human experience. Because of the break in the relationship between creator and creature, the creator says, life will now contain my wrath as part of your everyday experience. So, let's take a look at that. To the woman, he said, verse 16, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, we've got to be really careful here, everyone, okay? And we could have some wonderful discussions about why the wrath of God is built into to the experience of women, and then built into the experience of men, in different ways. What does God say to Adam? Verse 17, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and so on. Verse 19, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Now, I don't think tonight is the time. It may be if we, if we do more of Genesis 3, but right now, I don't think we need to discuss about men and women and the differences between the two. The main idea is this. In every aspect of human life, the wrath of God is being worked out day to day. You cannot escape it, but confronted with it in your everyday experience. So for a man, a man, and this is how Genesis 3 explains it, men are going to know the wrath of God in their daily experience. Women are going to know the wrath of God in their private experience. But the main idea is life is not separate from a constant experience of God's wrath. Now, that's terrible, isn't it? That's really huge and scary. But that is what the Bible's proclamation is. Sin is the problem. 
What is it? Well, it's this relationship breach. What its consequences for human experience? And then the, the last bit, how does God respond to it? Now, I said at the start, Philip said to the Ethiopian, starting with Isaiah, you look for Jesus. Now, I want you to think about where do you see Jesus here? Where is the message of Jesus Christ? Now, Philip found it, didn't he, when he looked at Isaiah? Where is it here? And you can see it very clearly here by comparing two verses. So if I, I ask you, first of all, to look at verse 7, okay? So verse 7, the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now what you need to do, and the author of Genesis wants you to do this, you compare that verse with verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made coverings of skin and clothed them. Now here you have Adam and Eve initially making themselves coverings, and then you have God doing it for them. Now what you need to do is our old friend, compare and contrast, okay? So as you compare those two verses, what you've got is the common idea of, of coverings, clothing. Clothing to hide the nakedness and the shame. Clothing so that human beings uh, have covered their, their sinfulness. Now, that's what both verses have in common. What's the difference then? Well, verse 7, Adam and Eve made clothes for themselves. And they clothe themselves with fig leaves. In the, the verse that talks about God, verse 21, God makes clothes for Adam and Eve. And God makes clothes from animals. And so what has happened in verse 21 is animals' lives have been ended. The lives of animals have provided the covering the food, the blood of animals have been shed. Blood has been shed in order to provide coverings for Adam and Eve. And there you have in verse 21, the very first idea of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the one whom God clothes us in. Jesus Christ is God's covering for us to hide our shame and our guilt. And it is the blood of Jesus Christ shed upon the cross that provides us with his skin, his righteousness, his holiness that God provides for us to cover us so that our nakedness and our guilt and our shame are hidden. So what you have in Genesis 3.21 is what's known as the Proto-Evangel. It's the very first occasion in the Bible of the good news message. Human beings from this time forward have tried to cover ourselves. We have tried to make ourselves right. We have tried to hide before God under layers of what we can do ourselves. But the great message here is that God himself has clothed us. God himself has provided a way to cover us and hide our shame and our guilt. And what God has provided is his son, Jesus Christ. So you've got an animal sacrifice in verse 21. This will then become, as the Bible's message unfolds, this will then become the very um, basis for the temple 
and how the temple then in the Old Testament will be a place of animal sacrifices, the lives of animals, the blood of animals being provided to make up for and to atone for human sin. So here you have the inception of the idea of the temple. And then that then will ultimately be um, fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ when he gives his blood and we are clothed in his righteousness. So here's Genesis 3, everyone. It's, as I say, the, the presentation of the notion of sin, sin as the fundamental human problem, sin as a, a matter of relation with God, its consequences, God's response to it, and then this little hint here, almost unnoticed as you read Gen Genesis 3 itself. Verse 21, God's solution. God's solution to sin, which is blood and, and clothing and sacrifice and being covered. Okay? That's what we see in Genesis chapter 3. That's the way the message begins. Thank you.